Hey, my name is John. I'm one of the pastors here. Excited to have you with us on this Father's Day as we celebrate us. Dads, this is our day. Hey, we're going to get ready to jump into the scriptures. We're in the midst of a brand new series called Live Green. Everybody say Live Green. We're not talking about being environmentally conscious, although, amen, let's be good stewards, and we're not talking about medicinal marijuana. No, we are talking about discipleship. Jesus said in Matthew 28, he said, go and make, help me say it, disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and hey, I'm with you always to the end of the age. What is a disciple? And what does it mean to make disciples? Here at Greenhouse, we exist to help ordinary people like you and I. I know dads are not ordinary today, right? We're extraordinary. We see the superheroes. But ordinary people like you and I become passionate followers of Jesus. Sounds great. How do we do it? How do we do it? And so if you'll stand with me to your feet, if you're watching online, you can do the same thing as we get ready to read and honor God's word. Last week, if you remember, I've got a little clip from the video we watched last week. Last week, we talked about how we want to live in the green. We want to live in the green. There's a clip for me. And we said the green starts with yellow, that, that yellow arrow pointing up to God. Jesus said, here's where you start. The first commandment, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so if last week was all about the yellow of what it means to live in the green, right? Y'all are catching this idea, the intersection of worship and mission and community, that's green. If if yellow is where it starts, then blue is where it goes next. This week, I want to talk about community. Everybody say community. How many of you live in a community? How many of you have community around you? We're going to dive deeper on the topic of what it means to be in biblical community with one another. If you've got a Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 18 is where we'll be gathering our text from this morning. Guyana crew, those of you watching online, I am super excited to be with you this week, this evening. I fly out to Guyana along with Pastor Mike and Michelle, our missions coordinator, so it should be awesome. So excited to meet you guys in person. Church, can you pray for me? Can you pray for us? Yes? Okay, cool. I'm just going to imagine that everybody said yes, including online, in Jesus' name, because we need it. Are you ready? Thank you. Somebody yelled. Are, are the rest of y'all ready? Yeah. Pastor Gary, are you ready? Oh, he's ready. All right, here we go. He was like, well, how do you see me? I see everything. <laughs> First Samuel 18. This is the story of David and Jonathan. If you're not familiar, let me catch us up to speed. There is this king. His name is God. The Israelites decide they don't want God as king. They don't want a theocracy. They want a governing ruler. And so they say, we want a king like the other nations. Because peer pressure is always a thing, no matter how old you are. And so they say, we want a king like all the other nations. God says, no, you don't. They say, yes, we do. And so he finally says, I'll give you what you want. Be careful what you pray for. So they say, give us a king, give us a king. And so he gives them a king. His name is Saul. He starts out great. He ends up horrible. But in between, he has a son whose name is Jonathan. Fantastic name. It's a strong name, bold name, biblical name, amazing name. You know what I'm saying, Romulus? Come on. It happens to be my name. just happens to also be my name. But that's not the point. That's not the point. But Jonathan, the son of Saul, he has a best friend. His name is David. And David and Jonathan, well, let's just get into the text. After David had finished talking with Saul, the king, Jonathan, Saul's son, becomes one in spirit with David, and he loved him as he loved himself. Now, this is not talking about homoerotic love. This is talking about an agape type of love. This is talking about a deep, biblical, self-sacrificial love. This is what this Hebrew idea means of he loved him as he loved himself. Verse 2, from that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant. Everybody say covenant. Jonathan made a covenant. In our culture, we do contracts. Contract is quid pro quo. If you do for me, then I'll do for you. And if you drop the ball, then we're done. Covenant is much deeper. Covenant is much more significant. Covenant is inherently profound and spiritual in some ways. It's saying, here is what's happening till death do us part. Does that sound familiar to anyone? It's what marriage is supposed to be. He makes a covenant because he loved him as himself. 
Now Jonathan took off his royal robe he was wearing and he gave it to David symbolically along with his tunic and his sword and his bow and his belt. And whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army and this pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the privilege of gathering publicly. Lord, what a gift and an honor it is in a country like ours to be able to do that, and we thank you for that. We thank you for Western High School and the blessing it's been to partner here at this school to see the gospel bring about flourishing in this school, in this community, in this student body. Lord, we pray your blessing on Western High School, and Lord, I, I pray a specific blessing over every single dad listening under the sound of my voice, watching online, here in the room, later on demand. Lord, would you raise them up to be the servant leaders that you've created them to be? In Jesus' name, amen. You can find your seats in the room, watching online. I want to begin as I often do with a question. You ever had a friend in your life that had your back no matter what? Anybody ever had that experience? You, just, you got a friend, if the friend's next to you, just give them a pat on the back, right? It's like, man, you're that friend. If it's your spouse, hopefully that's a pat right there, trying to set y'all up. And uh, my, my wife and I have two children. We have our oldest son, Liam. He's almost five. He's about to start kindergarten in the fall. Crazy, mind-blowing. Our daughter, Lucia, turns two this month, and they got each other's backs. I mean, these two love each other, and it's precious, it's precious. Little Lucia, the first thing when she wakes up in the morning, she does not pray to God and she does not say mama and dada. She says, where's bra-bra? Where's bra-bra? Bra-bra up? Bra-bra up? I mean, this girl loves her bra-bra. She loves her brother and he loves her back. I remember one time, Lucy's super sweet. She's our little joy factory. She's always laughing and dancing. And, and, but, but, you know, she's not saved yet and so she'll also be disobedient. And so she was trying to get into a cupboard that she knew she was not supposed to get into and she starts messing with it. And we're like, I'm like, Lucy, don't touch that. She kind of looks at me. That little mischievous grin. She starts going, I'm like, Lucy, don't touch that. And now there was glass in there. It was dangerous, right? I realized she doesn't see and know what's happening, but I realize it could be to her detriment, which, by the way, is why good fathers give instructions of what not to do. That'll preach, different sermon. And so she's starting to go in there and mess with it. And finally, I realized she's about to open this thing and all the glass is gonna be in danger of falling and breaking and hurting and feet and no shoes and all of that. And so I have to raise my voice for her protection. I say, Lucy, don't. And she's so sweet and precious. That's all it takes. She looks at me. She just, she starts, she starts, I mean, bawling. All it takes is a stern little word for Lucy. She's so soft hearted. And so I'm like, okay. And so she comes over. But what I did not realize is that her, her bodyguard was in the room. Not Nancy, Liam. And Liam looks at me incredulous. He's like, Dad, why did you make Lucy cry? And I start defending myself to my four-year-old. I'm like, well, you see what happened, son, is that there was there, and there was glass in there. And then if I do, and I'm like, he's going to beat me up. I'm like, and then, and then what happened, he said, Dad, that was mean. Apologize to Lucy. You know what I did? I slept on this plan. I apologized to Lucy. That's what I did. I was like, I'm so sorry, Lucy. What am I doing? But it's not just, it's not just Liam that looks out for Lucy. Lucy looks out for Liam. Like if he, my, my son has big emotions. He's passionate. And so if he's, if he gets upset about something and God forbid, he starts to cry. Lucy immediately, like a switch, goes, he starts crying. Bro, bro, crying. Bro, bro, crying. Bro, bro. She runs over. It doesn't matter what happened. She just starts petting him. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Bro, bro, crying. I'm sorry. I'm like, these two, I pray to God this relationship lasts because it's beautiful. What's my point? I love my kids. It's Father's Day. I don't know. Just give me some slack, all right? But I do have a point, and here's my point. We all need that. We all need that. Some of us raise our hand. We're like, man, I got a friend who's got my back. And for those of us who didn't, we wish that we did. See, here's why this matters. Jesus, we mentioned it last week, and if you missed it, I encourage you to check it out on our podcast or our YouTube channel. Just search Greenhouse South Florida. But Jesus kicks off this idea of discipleship and what it means to be a disciple and live green by saying there is a first commandment that should be our first priority. What is it? Love the Lord your God. Love the Lord your God. Being a disciple, living green, begins with that yellow. It begins with worship. But if the first commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, is the first priority, Jesus didn't leave it there. This is why we're not monks here at Greenhouse. We're disciples. 
No shade on the monks. Not our call. Jesus said the first command is the first priority, but the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Here's my point. If the first commandment is the first priority, then the second commandment is the second priority. You don't actually just, if, if Jesus just said, here's what you gotta know, go love God. You're like, all right, amen, church, let's go do it. Go slap your neighbor on the way out, but as long as you love God, you're great. Jesus didn't say that. He said, I got the first commandment, get that one on track, because that's, that's where it begins. But the second commandment, it's just as vital. The next thing after covenant relationship with God, Jesus said, is covenant relationship with people. You need community. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need community. Tell them, tell them, tell them, you need community. You, you do, you do. You need community, you need community, and I need community, and we need community. What's community? Let me tell you, community is real people that have a real and deep commitment where we have their back and they have ours. Community is real people with a real and deep commitment where we have our back and they have our back and we have theirs. I was deeply impacted this week reflecting on the story of David and Jonathan. And so I wanna make one clear and I'm hoping compelling port this morning. And the point is this, if you're taking notes, I'd encourage you to jot this down. Is that Rebecca Jacob over there? What's up, Rebecca? It's good to see you. Sorry, distraction, ADD. In order, here's my point. In order to flourish like God intended, in order to flourish like God intended, you need real people who love you in a real way in covenant with a real God. In order to flourish like God intended, because we can use words like community, it's kind of like Christianese, like yeah, 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 this is what I mean. You need real people who love you in a real way in covenant with a real God. Or if I want to say it another way, another way on this Father's Day, I would say that every David needs a Jonathan. Every David needs a Jonathan. And every Davidina needs a Jonathina. Contextualize as you need to. Let's jump into this thing. Let me give us a little sense of the story. How many of you are vaguely familiar with the story of David and Jonathan and Saul? If you're not, fantastic reading for you this week. Book of 1 Samuel, start around chapter 10. It's a true story. It's got all the drama of a Hollywood movie, and it is exceptionally riveting and divinely influenced. In 1 Samuel 14, we're introduced to Jonathan. We know that Saul has a son named Jonathan, but we don't really know what he's like until 1 Samuel chapter 14. And what we find out is that Jonathan is a champ. Jonathan is bold. Jonathan is strong. Jonathan is brave. Jonathan is courageous. I like just talking about Jonathan because it feels like I'm bragging on myself in the third person. Jonathan is the man, Romulus, that is. Now, in the Bible, he's... We're given this story, and it seems sort of abstract, but it makes sense in context. Jonathan is there, and, and the arch enemies of the people of God, the Philistines, are they're in battle, and, and it's not looking super great for the, for the Israelites. They're a little nervous. They're a little worried. They're pretty thoroughly outnumbered, and so they're figuring out what they're going to do. And so Jonathan goes off on his own little scouting mission. He brings his little armor bearer with him, and he's like, hey, bud, we're going to go up there. And so they get, and they start looking out, and they're looking at all the Philistines, and they're like, man, God, you got to do something. And so Jonathan just kind of comes up with this plan. He's like, hey, listen, he talks to his armor bearers, just him and his armor bearer, whole army. He's like, listen, here's what we're going to do, bro. We're going to roll up on them. This is my own version. We're going to roll up on them. And if they tell us, hey, hey, just wait right there. We're going to come, we're going to come say what's up to y'all. We're going to run. But if they tell us, oh, why don't you come up here, big boy? Let's see what you can do. Then we're going to know God gave them over to us and we're going to take them out. Don't know if I would recommend the stakes being that high, like your death to give a fleece, but that's what Jonathan did. And so he rolls up. Sure enough, the Philistines are like, oh, come on, come on, let's see what you can do. And Dave, Jonathan's like, this is our moment. His armor bearer was just as crazy as he was. He's like, all right, cool, let's do it. And so they go up there. It says they slay 20 men it, just like that, him and his armor bearer, 20 guys, boom, down. The whole Philistine army starts freaking out. They're like, who are these warriors? What are we going to do? God comes and brings about the victory through this courageous and bold act. Jonathan was a brave heart. Before he ever met David, 
By the time Jonathan enters the scene, we see this champion, this man after God's own heart, Scripture calls David, and we see that David had this heart of courage, this heart of boldness, but Jonathan was a brave heart as well. Jonathan was a champ. He gets linked up with David, who's a champ. Now they got a championship team. This is like the Brooklyn Nets before everyone starts going down, right? They're like sniper fire or something. This is, this is like the Golden State Warriors of old, right? David and Jonathan, two champions going for the ship. S-H-I-P, championship. I didn't just cuss in church, all right? They're going for it. David and Jonathan, Jonathan and David, we were made for covenant relationships with God and with people. Now, you might know this on a spiritual level. You're like, yeah, I know this, Pastor John, like a covenant with God, like that we talked about that last week. Or maybe you're like the, the covenant of marriage, Right? You're like, yeah, here, here, here's a solution. And, and this is in the church world where we often go. We're like, amen, covenant. Y'all got to get married, right? How many of you are not married and you'd like to be married? Anybody one time, Lord, answer that prayer. I, you can look around right now. I'm trying to help y'all out. Um, just saying, but um, right, we, we go there. We're like, well, yes, covenant of marriage. You got to get married. And David would say, amen, because God knows he had his issue with females. That's another sermon. But it's not just marriage. David would say, you also need to get the right friendships as well. See, the new covenant that we're ushered into through Jesus is not just a covenant with God. It is a covenant with God and his people. We are brought into covenant community. So on this Father's Day, I started thinking about men. Specifically, I started thinking about how many of us have truly deep, meaningful relationships and friendships outside of our spouse or significant other. And if you did not know, the stats are not particularly inspiring. It presents a bleak picture. One article in Wall Street Journal said it like this. It said, modern men are neglecting friendships. Over the past 30 years, when polled, researchers discovered that the number of people Americans called confidants fell by almost one-third. You guys familiar with this term confidant? It's a a friend or trusted person that you would really share your your true deep heart with. Fell by one-third. Specifically, men's average number of confidants or close friendships dropped by 44%. They said this, the trend is clear. Many men don't have enough friends and it could be endangering their physical and mental health. Things like lower blood pressure, lower BMI, less likely to experience depression. Life expectancy can be up to 22% longer. They said, in fact, loneliness, we have found, has the same effect on mortality as smoking 15 cigarettes per day. Crazy, right? This isn't just, by the way, this is what I love about the scriptures. God tells us the truth, and eventually science catches up. This is why God and science are not in opposition to one another. Honest science and science with integrity ultimately lands at what God had always said. I kind of geek out on neuroscience and what they find is they find these riveting discoveries. I'm like, oh, you mean that Bible verse that God wrote 2,000 years ago? Yeah, he said that a while ago, but science is finally catching up. What we know is we're made for community. We're made for connection. We're made for relationships, deep Lasting, bonded, covenant with God and people. See, but it's not just physical or emotional health that, that hangs in the balance. It's, it's even more deeply entrenched. It's our spiritual health as well. Here's the problem. We were made for community. And when we're in the right community, we thrive. But when we're in the wrong community, we wither. We've, we've preached this before at different parts in our community here at the greenhouse. And if you're new here, we're thrilled that you're here. If you're not even a Jesus person, I'm hoping that some of this is compelling because you're like, man, that's not the, the, all of these stats pertain to atheists and agnostics and Buddhists and Muslims. Like it's, it's humans and, and I'm praying, but, but we've talked about this before. We've said things like your life will follow your community. Friends are like elevators. They're either going to take you up or what? They're going to take you down. We we said things like, show me your friends. Pastor Robbie, one time, shout out. He's my mentor and coach, one of the pastors in my life from Greenhouse Gainesville. He would always say to the youth, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. That'll preach. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Here's where I want to go with David and Jonathan. I couldn't shake it all week long. As you dive into the story, and I I encourage you to do so this week in your own time, as you dive into the story, you realize that as long as David had a Jonathan, he thrived. 
He was slaying giants. He was passionately worshiping God. He was being used by God. He was this man after God's own heart. He was winning battles. All these things were happening. And then Jonathan goes out to battle with his father Saul and and he's struck by the archers and, and he doesn't make it. And as you flip in the story, you realize that something really curious, that David who thrived off this close covenant friendship, when Jonathan dies, he never replaces him. And in fact, I would argue that you can point to David's demise as soon as Jonathan expires. See, when he loses Jonathan, he doesn't just lose Jonathan, David begins to lose himself. And everything starts going downhill. And I'm making some sort of a conjecture here, but I I have to imagine, is that just a coincidence? All the Bathsheba stuff, y'all remember the story? He ends up sleeping with someone else's wife and doing all sorts of shysty stuff, gets a guy murdered. I mean, David starts out great and has a really dark moment. What in the world happened? Jonathan died. And he never replaces that role. Here's my point. David's need Jonathan's. And Davidinas need Jonathanas. David needs Jonathan's and you need community. I can't tell you how many heartbreaking conversations I've had that center around this exact topic. I'm talking to men, I'm talking to women, I'm talking to all the humans in our church community that I love. I I can't tell you how many heartbreaking conversations at this point, almost 18 years into into ministry where where I'm on the phone with somebody and they they love God and they had a heart after God. I mean, they remind me of they were a little David or a Davidina. They were going after God and and then all of a sudden, I don't know how I made this crazy decision and and compromised my career. I don't know how I made this crazy decision and compromised my integrity. I don't know how I made this crazy decision and ended up in this affair, this emotional affair, this actual, like, Pastor John, how did I even get here? And almost every single time without fail, as begin to trace back and defrag through the process, you know what happened? They started with a drift from community. It rarely starts with a drift from God, by the way. It typically starts with, man, I'm, Pastor John, I'm so busy. Man, microchurch, I know, I know you got, have you been in the microchurch? I get invited like 15 times every time I go to the greenhouse. Like, no, I don't even know if I like y'all. Chill out. And then you get in one and you're like, man, this is great. And then life gets busy. And work starts asking you for extra roles and you get promoted and you have more responsibilities and you have different things going on. And so community becomes increasingly inconvenient. And so you're like, ah, I I'll just miss a week here and there, it's fine. And then you miss a few more, and then you miss a few more, and eventually you find yourself outside of community. And friends, I'm telling you, I see it over and over and over and over again, and I love you too much to let it happen without you having any idea. What begins as a drift from the community of God almost inevitably ends as a drift from God himself. Why? Because community and God's infinite sovereignty has been ordained as almost a seatbelt for the soul. You might still crash, but you won't die because they keep you tethered. As long as David had Jonathan, he was still the same David. Buddy, Buddy had some issues, but Jonathan kept him tethered. Jonathan keeps him close. Jonathan pulls him back. We all need that person in our life that gasses us up and we need the encouragement. Come on, man, so you can do it. You're gonna get that job. Come on, babe. Are they, man, they're a bunch of fools if they don't realize what they got in you. We all need that friend. And we need that same friend who's like, man, I love you so much. Shut up and sit down if in Jesus' name. Right? Every David needs a Jonathan. And you need Community. When you have the right community and covenant relationships, mistakes that could have destroyed you do not. And by the way, it's not just David and Jonathan. This is echoed all throughout the totality of Scripture. Solomon, the wisest human to ever walk the planet outside of Jesus, the God man, he said it like this in Proverbs 13. He said, he who walks with wise men, what does it say? Will become wise. Well, what's the converse? but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Solomon says, listen, I'm gonna lay it out to you. Whether you wanna believe it or not, it's just like gravity. It's a spiritual law. Whoever you get around, you will become like. And if you walk with wise men, you're gonna become wise. And if you get around a bunch of fools, it might be fun for a moment being all sorts of ratchet, but it'll end in destruction. See, we get this. 
I think we do. Like, we're like, yeah, that's true. We all remember, like, yeah, I remember in middle school, man, I got around these little crazy babies kids, and they were doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And, man, I remember, it was fun, but, man, I got in a lot of trouble. And then I got around some studious. Like, we, we know this is true, and we actually do this in so many other sectors of life. I was reading up on the Navy SEALs. The Navy SEALs, when, when they launch, when they deploy, when they parachute down and the paratroopers find out, when they find themselves in a new scenario, they ask three questions immediately to get a barometer for success. The first question is, where am I? It's a good question, right? Where am I? Question number two is, where is the enemy? Another great question. But here's the third one. Where's my buddy? Where am I? Where's the enemy? Where's my buddy? They say, and the third question is actually the most important because it can help with all the rest. Navy SEALs, they, they get this. When life or death is on the line, they're not saying, where, where's my gun? How's my weapon? How's my... What they're realizing is I got to know, know where I am. I got to know who's against me. And I got to know who's with me. We realize this. Friend, you and I, we need real people who love you in a real way, in covenant with a real God. You need real people who love you in a real way, in covenant with a real God. Why? Because every David needs a Jonathan. We see this in all other sectors. How many of you know what this is? It's a phone. It's an iPhone, God's favorite uh, superior uh, computing device, but that, that's not the point. But it's a phone. Um, how many of you have flown on an airplane before? Remember when we used to be able to do that kind of stuff? Like, that was amazing. This is going to be my first time on a flight, Guyana, in like, I don't know, two years, something like that. But, but uh, you, you get your phone, and, um, you know, you're on your flight, and you do whatever. You put it on airplane mode, because thank God that exists now, and they don't have to pester you to turn off your phone, even though it's on airplane mode. I still got the PTSD. I'm not going to talk about that. But you got it on airplane mode, and then you land, and what's the first thing that you do when you land on a flight? Some of you are like, I pray. Don't be, don't, don't, no, no, you don't. Y'all so spiritual. It's the first thing. You get out your phone, you turn it back on, you flip it off airplane mode, right? You're like, I've been, I, I've been detached. I don't know what's happening in the world. What happened on social media while I was gone? Like, what's going on with Beyonce? Like, what's, going, what's happening? I don't know where, where y'all are at, but you're, you're asking these things, and, but your phone doesn't turn on right away, does it? See, it takes a little bit of time up at the tight, top right corner of your screen if you got an iPhone. The rest of y'all, I can't help you. But if you got an iPhone, up at the tight right corner, it'll say this little phrase. It says, searching for connection. Why? Don't miss this. Because this supercomputer that you hold in your pocket cannot do what it was intended to do without the proper connection, without its network. This thing that has limitless, in some ways, capabilities, technology that other generations could not even fathom, hold it in your hand, cannot do what it was created to do without the proper connectivity, without its network. That'll preach. That'll preach. Friend, let me remind, like, God loves you so much. Watch it online. God loves you so much so much and he has absolutely incredible plans and an incredible mission for your life but if you don't get your community connection right you are in danger of missing it all why because the bible not for nothing gives us the clear metaphor that this life is like a battle a navy seals illustration is actually very appropriate See, while we have an advocate for our souls, Jesus, the Messiah, interceding for us at the right hand of the Father, we also have an enemy of our souls. His name is the devil. And he's not just a spiritual boogeyman. Believe me, he is very much real and active. And the scriptures tell us that his mission is to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, he is potent, but he, is not, he has a very limited bag of tricks that he uses over and over again because they're very effective and he doesn't need to venture out too far. Can I tell you one that he uses almost every single time without fail? Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. Here's why community is so essential. Because you'll, you'll event, you'll, when you're here and you're with Jesus and you, you got the yellow happening and you're in worship and then you get the blue going on and you're in community and you get on mission and you start going green, man, the devil's like, damn, snap, man, I can't even mess with him. And so what does he do? He, he tries to get you to, man, you see, you see what that person, you see what they did that Father's Day post? They didn't tag you. They tagged all the rest of the microchurch, but they didn't tag you. 
That's because they think you're a bad dad. And he starts whispering these lies to distance you. Initially, he's not going to be stupid and say, oh, see, God doesn't even care about you. Like, man, shut up. God loves me. He'll start with, man, you know that person? And and if he can push off and, and get you distanced from people and get you alienated from community and get you off on an island and get you out on your own and get you to a spot, then the lies that began about God's people eventually become lies about God himself. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Come on. And when that happens, you have no one to help you correct the lies, so you believe them. Time and time and time again, I watch the same trap work over and over and over. To people that I love, to me, myself, and I. I'm not preaching with passion because I'm like, y'all need to get your stuff together. Come on, people. I'm like, we need to get our stuff. I've been here. I've been here. I remember a season of my life because of my job and I was doing a bunch of traveling. I had, I had increasingly gotten isolated. And I had one connection. It was Pastor Robbie. I was in Gainesville at the time. I worked for a charity foundation in Toronto. Pastor Robbie said, hey, man, do you know anybody where you're going? I was like, bro, I don't know anybody. He said, hey, let's Skype every single week so you can have a connection point. By the way, there was this thing called Skype. You used to have to pay money for it. Like actual doll hairs to like talk to people is crazy, right? And so every single week, almost every week without fail, we would jump on this Skype call. Hey, how you? You're talking and then all of a sudden you hear them like 15 seconds later like, yeah, I'm doing good too. You're like, oh, you didn't hear nothing I said. And, and so we're doing this back and forth and he just stuck with me. Why? Because he's like, John, God has a call on your life and I was not planning on going back to Gainesville. I was not planning on being a part of Greenhouse anymore. I didn't know what I was gonna do with my life. But he said, John, I love you and we're in relationship and I'm not gonna watch the enemy take you out. I got your back. Yeah. And I remember in that season when, when things were challenging, when things were difficult, when things got hard, I remember Pastor Robbie ended up being the manifestation to me of the love of God. That as the lies from the enemy, because it was a lonely season, inevitably came, he would be right there every week to bring me back to, 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 a, to a centering point, this, this balancing agent in my life. Nah, John, I know you feel that way. That's not true, man. That's, uh, yeah, that's not true. That's crazy, right? He's like, oh, that's crazy. I'm like, well, how did I? And he'd bring me back. Every David needs a Jonathan. Hebrew says it like this. I don't even have it in my notes. Boom. Thank you, tech team. One time, can we give it up for this tech team? Man, streaming online and doing all this stuff. Y'all are amazing. The writer of Hebrews says this. It says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and the much more as you see the day approaching. This is what the scriptures say we need. We need to be people that are actively on the lookout. We're not ceasing to come together. We're actively coming together. Why? For the purpose of stirring one another up. This word exhorting, it's like, a, it's like when a football coach gets up in your face. He's like, come on, John. You got this. You can do this. Like you're, you're sparking life. You're sparking faith. You're reminding someone with passion of who they are and who they can be. He says, you need this. Other versions say exhorting one another Daily. Daily. You ever wonder how the book of Acts was so alive? I'll give you a clue. They met together daily. Sit in the temple courts and from house to house, breaking bread, enjoying enjoying meals with a gladness and simplicity of heart. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. If the first commandment is love the Lord your God, the second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because if you start doing that, mission is the natural outcropping of deep, genuine covenant with God and covenant relationships with people. Davids need Jonathans, and you need community like this. In my life, I've got got a few pastors here locally. When I'm in a tough spot, I call them up. A few weeks ago, I called one of my buddies and said, man, there's a few crazy things happening. I said, bro, I feel like, I feel like there's some level of just like a spiritual attack. This just feels heavy. Can you pray for me? This, this week, he called me up. I get around Pastor Robert. By the way, Pastor Robert, you want to talk about someone who exhorts. This joker is like the exhortation king. Let me give some honor where honors due. Pastor Robert, I could come in there. He's like a spiritual personal trainer. I could come in there, drag it. I'm like, man, Pastor Robert. He's like, John, come on. You got this. The joy, and he, he just starts flooding out script. You, see, you ever had that conversation with Pastor Robert? Some of you are nodding your heads because you're laughing. Like, this joker, he will just exhort and call us to faith. 
Do you have a community like that? Do you have a David like that? Do you have a Jonathan like that in your life? You're like, Pastor John, community is essential. I'm getting ready to land it here, worship team. You guys can come up and we'll close in a chorus, but you're like, community is essential, Pastor John. I, I get it. We need it. It's, it. it's important. So why do we struggle with it so much? Right? I think most of us would say like, yeah, amen, I know. And, and even if I'm not in that community right now, I know I need that community. If I can look back on my life in times where I was really thriving, I was in a community like that. It was intentional and it was deep and it was real and it was raw and it was genuine and it was messy, but it was beautiful. So why don't we do it? Because we're a mess. <laughs> like, have you ever met you? <laughs> like, have I ever met me? Like, like, on one hand, we're insecure, right? So we keep people at arm's distance because we don't want them to see the real us because if they saw the real us, what would they think about us? And maybe they would post about that online and oh my goodness, it could be crazy, right? So on one hand, we're insecure, so we push people away. And then on the other hand, we're just a hot mess. And so when we're not pushing people away intentionally, we're pushing people away unintentionally because we're mean and we're, we're punks sometimes, right? No, just me? Okay, cool. I'm a punk sometimes, insecure, hard to love. And if we really want, you know, we could be here at a little pump up session and be like, come on, we got this. Everyone's like, yeah, but, but this is David who blew this. This is da like the man after God's own, God's own heart, David, who missed this. I don't know about the rest of y'all. I'm like, if, if David can't get this, I don't have a ton of confidence for me because life happens. And Jonathan's die, and relationships drift, and people, they, they grow apart. And if our ability to thrive in the long haul is based on our ability to thrive in community, in our own effort and emotional fortitude, I don't have a very good prognosis for me, and I don't have a very good prognosis for you either. Which is why our ultimate hope comes from an even better Jonathan than the one we're introduced to in 1 Samuel 14. We're given this little random tidbit of information here in 1 Samuel 18, and, and you can just kind of gloss over it and be like, well, that was weird. And, but it's pointing to something. It says that David has this connection with Jonathan, and Jonathan has this deep covenant connection. And it says that Jonathan, in fact, even makes a covenant with David, loves him as his own self. Verse 3, he made this covenant. Look what he does. And he takes off his royal robe gives it to David along with his tunic, his belt, his sword, and his bow. I need you to understand what's happening here because it's something profound. Jonathan is the heir to the throne. Jonathan will become the next king. And so Jonathan, out of love for another, takes off his royal robe, removes all his protective elements, and says, David, I'm with you and you're with me. We're in covenant relationship with one another. And he strips himself of royalty and makes himself nothing. Why? Because of a deep love for people, because of a deep love for a person. Do you see where I'm going with this, friends? Because there was another Jonathan that came along and the scriptures have foretold that there was this Messiah and he would come and he would rescue the people from their sins. And when he came, it, it says of him in the scriptures, it was this mystery. It said, you know, there, there's a friend and he sticks closer than a brother. And this greater Jonathan, he comes along and his name is Jesus. And he comes down into our scenario and he meets a bunch of David full of potential and promise, but full of all sorts of issues and baggage and character flaws waiting to be exposed. And he sees us in our state and he sees us in our position. And Philippians tells us he looks down and with compassion, he takes off his royal robe and he goes to a cross and all of the defensive weapons that were at his disposal where he very easily could have gotten down off that cross, he lays them down of his own voluntary will. Why? Because of deep love for another, for a person in particular. Saul eventually gets so furious at Jonathan in, in the text, in the story, he's like, Jonathan, what are you doing? Don't you realize you're giving David the kingdom? Don't you realize your self-sacrificial love? You're going to kill your chances of the kingdom coming to you, and instead it's going to come to him. And Peter said the same, Jesus, don't do it. You're going to kill your chances of the kingdom coming to you. And Jesus said, yeah, but instead it's going to come to them. 
Friend, Jesus is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. And because he is with us, we can trust and step out to love others. Because of his love, we can step out to love others deeply. Even if we know they're, they're gonna let us down and they are gonna hurt us and people are gonna wound us because they're humans and they're flawed and they're fragile. But because of his great love, because of his, the fact that he is with us and he'll never leave us nor forsake us, we know Jesus, if this is what blesses your heart and if this is what you say I need, then I am in. Friends, you need a Jonathan. Every David needs a Jonathan. Every David full of potential, full of promise, full of destiny, but full of flaws needs a Jonathan whose love will protect and guard and help and heal. And the greatest Jonathan ever is here now and his name is Jesus and I pray you would receive him today. Let's pray. You can bow your heads just for a moment of quiet and privacy. This is between you and God. If you're here and you say, Pastor John, I, maybe you grew up with some sort of a, a, a Jesus-like connection, a, a relationship. You, maybe you were around church. Maybe this is brand new for you. You came in from another religious background, a no religious background, but something in your heart is telling you this is real. This is true. It's because it is. And if you're here this morning and you need to place your trust in Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. If you're here and you need to receive Jesus, the friend who sticks closer than a brother, all you have to do is reach out. Even right there, you can just look up to heaven and say, Jesus, I need you. I need your help. I need you to train me. I need you to teach me. I need you to change me. I need you. There's no magical prayer here. If you're in the room, if you're watching online, it's just something from the heart. Jesus, I'm listening. You've got my attention. I'm yours. Maybe you're here and you need to embrace. You've already begun a relationship journey with Jesus, but you realize that maybe the Holy Spirit has highlighted that you have begun a relationship with Jesus, but you need to embrace the people of Jesus. You've got covenant relationship with God, but you need to embrace covenant relationship with the people of God. True, deep, genuine, vulnerable, real, and raw community to get a Jonathan in your life and to be a Jonathan to someone else. If that's you, wherever you're at, I want you to just do the same thing. God, I'm listening. Help me. Give me courage to love people like you love them. Give me courage to press into community where I know people have let me down in the past. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Pray a prayer like Jesus. Here's how we're going to close. You can look up at me. And actually, if we could all stand to our feet, we're going to sing a final chorus. If I could get some prayer partners up here to line the front. If you're watching online and God's working in your heart, we would love to pray with you. We'd love to connect with you. You can request prayer right there in the chat. You can text Jesus to the number on the screen. We'll text you back. We'll call you, whatever your preference is. But if you're here in the room, before you go, if God is working on your heart, don't just leave. Lunch can wait. Plans can wait. Father's Day is amazing. It can wait an extra five, 10 minutes for God to do his work deeply in your soul. And if he's beginning something, let me tell you, it is good and it is worth it. And as soon as we begin to sing, the altars are open. Why don't you come forward?